Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. As we head toward the end of our Lenten season, we find in today's scripture readings God doing familiar things, but in new and sometimes disturbing ways. The people of God are familiar with their creator. It is the God who has made deals with them, covenants, if you will, and set the ground rules for how to live life with God and how to remain under God's protection. God has made covenant with Noah and with Abraham, with the Israelites, and now here, the exiled people of Judah. Repeatedly, humanity has reneged on the deal. And yet God still returns again and again. God's always doing creative divine acts all around us, acts of forgiveness, acts of redemption that seek to draw all people into deeper relationship with God because God has always and will always desire to commune with humanity. In our Old Testament lesson today, we heard as God decides to do something new and different. We bear witness to a God who is responsive, a God who is evolving, a God who has the capacity to note when things haven't really been working out so well, and then to say, something's got to change. So under Abraham, the agreement with God, this covenant was sealed with sacrifice of animals at the altar. Under Moses, the covenant was sealed with circumcision. But here today, with the people of Judah, the terms are vastly different. They are new. This new covenant of God, this new reality, is to be inscribed and written upon their heart. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they will be my people. But what is it to have our bodies marked by God? From a 21st century perspective, cosmetic surgery, tattoos, and piercings are quite commonplace. And for some, are not such a big deal. Yet, these things are designed to be permanent, to last. We may choose to mark our bodies with images or words or symbols that hold great meaning for us. And they're often to remind us of a time or a place, or sometimes even to remind us of God. Yet many times throughout history, human beings, including those who claim to follow Jesus and be Christian, have marked the bodies of others for less honorable reasons. The branding of slaves like cattle, a mark of ownership put upon people, the tattooing of the wrists of captive Jewish people with permanent ID numbers by the National Socialists in Germany, Christian soldiers in Bosnia who branded a cross upon the forehead of Muslim prisoners of war. In our contemporary society in the 21st century, Gang members are one of the most visible signs of tattoos, tattoos that tell the tale to whom one belongs, the journey that one has taken, and sometimes even what someone has done to earn belonging. For example, a teardrop tattoo on the face can signify for a gang member both the loss of a loved one whose life was taken by a fellow gang or it can signify if it's a shallow, hollow teardrop, an attempted murder that they tried. Or if it's a solid teardrop, it can indicate that they have actually murdered someone. At Homeboy Industries, which is a nonprofit founded by a Jesuit priest, Father Greg Boyle, 
the number one most popular social service offered to those seeking rehabilitation from gang life is tattoo removal. For many, tattoo removal is that first step about leaving gang life. It's a first step in recognizing that the gang-related tattoos on their bodies are not welcome in the greater society and are a stigma. These markings have been set upon their bodies with the intention that they last forever, but they are become no longer relevant. And in fact, the most, in, the most mentioned reason that the clients want tattoos removed is for the hope of setting a good example for their own children. Their desire is to break the cycle, right? To stop the cycle of the gangs. And so tattoo removal is often the first step in surrendering and shedding their old identity and making space and room for what God calls them unto next. Now we know that it can be painful to get a tattoo, but it's even more painful to have them removed. And even with the removal, scars remain, scars that tell a story. Some of those markings can tell the world if you're a biker or a veteran, a flower child or a prisoner, a member of a fraternity or a clang, clan or a gang. The marks that we put upon our body and that we carry tell the world what we care about, what we think is beautiful, what is important or who is important in our lives. So this idea of a new covenant with God and God coming in and actually marking one's heart can be difficult to hold. God's covenant with the people is sealed by carving the law into the human heart. And it's important to remember that in Hebrew culture, the heart was not just the center of emotional life. The heart was understood to be the center of your moral, ethical, intellectual, and emotional life. The heart is where everyone understood behavior, thought, words, and actions to arise from. So for God to decide to not do something external with the body, but to place something internal so that it would fuse and foster relationship with God and then help them to be a blessing out into the world was brand new. In this new covenant, God touches the very heart of human desire. God always desires to turn humanity back to God to the creator, no matter what a person's life circumstance has been, no matter what they have done. As much as we say we love God, though, and I think we do, I think that we must admit that we struggle with the notion of submitting to a God who wants to touch and shape and, frankly, reshape our hearts. Being touched by God can sound pretty good, it can make us feel special, but if we're honest with ourselves, there is a cost of giving our heart over to God, and we're not really interested in paying it. We resist turning to God because we don't want to surrender to God's will. We pretty much like our own. We don't want to surrender to God and open our hearts because doing so restricts our choices. It dictates what our preferences should be and how we should behave and what we're to do in the world. It adds this level of responsibility to our lives, and our lives are already sufficiently full with responsibility. Truly, the calling of a life centered on God is not an easy choice, especially when the will of God is not the closest thing to our hearts. So God frequently gets pushed to the sidelines and we get placed in the center. Our priorities get shifted, and sometimes God even gets put on hold while we take other calls. I am sure you've all sat in a room where you're having an important conversation and a phone has rung, because today we have them everywhere with us. And how often do people actually interrupt their conversation with you to take that call? But how often do we interrupt our conversations to take God's call? Hmm. So what does it look like when our hearts have been marked by God? Jesus gives us some insight into that in today's gospel. 
He is about to be betrayed. It is the Passover. He is in Jerusalem already. He's been heralded in as a humble king on a donkey. And the wheels have been put in motion toward his death. He says two really important things in today's gospel. The first is that Jesus actually articulates that his soul is troubled. In the Greek, the word for troubled actually means deep sorrow or deep pain. And it's the same verb that is used in the story when Lazarus dies, Jesus finds the women crying and begins to weep himself. So he is completely and profoundly moved and impacted by what is about to happen to him. His heart, his soul is troubled. The next thing that he says is that whatever is to happen, it is God's name who should be glorified. He says, what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It's for this reason that I came. It's to glorify God. So Jesus is resolved. He knows what's coming, and he's not resisting it. But he makes very clear that he's not happy about it. He doesn't like it. And if we're honest, we don't either. None of us likes Christ being crucified. But the invitation before us is to be like Jesus, if we can, to practice the surrendering of the control of our lives back to the giver of life, the covenant maker, who gives us strength so that we can endure any hardship that we might face, any sorrow that is stepping us in the face, right? Jesus, by his actions, gives us hope and confidence that beyond the difficulties of this life, there is new life. He makes clear that the power of sin never, ever is greater than the power of God that is within us. So hold that a minute. The power of sin is never greater than the power of God that we hold within. If we open our hearts up and let God mark them. The whole point of our Lenten season is that we are called to try to be willing to let go of something. Try to let go and relinquish our attachment to that other thing, whatever it is that gets between us and God. Now, it was around 2009 or so that I began to have nightmares. I would have these dreams in which I thought I was dying. I was certain that I was being suffocated. I was being pushed down. I was dying. And with every ounce of my ability, I was fighting back. I was saying, no, no, I am not, no. And I would wake up out of a sound sleep screaming, no. And then I would be shaking and my heart racing. And I would take a moment and suddenly realize I'm in the safety of my own bedroom. I'm home. I'm OK. But this happened repeatedly. And one day when we went to church, Peter, being who Peter is, he's not there, he's over there. Um, Peter w said to our priest, Paul, in my earshot, you know, hey, Laurel, have you told Paul about your dreams? <laughs> and of course, I looked at Paul and I said, no. So I told Paul what I just shared with you. And Paul just stood there and he listened intently. And he looked me in the eye and he said, have you ever considered that you might need to die to self? Not having a clue what that meant. <laughs> I just looked at him and I went, no. <laughs> and he said, hmm, and nodded his head and he walked away. And so he left me with those words to ponder, and I didn't know what they meant. So I spent time over the next many months. I investigated. I looked up and Googled what does it mean to die to self. I had conversations with others, spent time in prayer. I was trying to figure out what is he talking about. And then it dawned on me one day that what he was speaking to is that there was a part of me in my identity that I was clinging to with both fists so tightly 
refusing to surrender, and that God was trying to call me into bearing different and new fruit. And when I realized that, I thought, oh my God, I've been so afraid. I've been so terrified of losing myself that I've refused to allow God to fill me and use me. Now, when the road became difficult for the Israelites, they turned to God in their suffering. And when the road for Jesus got right here and personal and difficult, he turned to God in his suffering. Jesus teaches us that we can be obedient to the will of God because God is a source of life, a source of energy, a source of bearing good fruit. We can follow Jesus' example, although it sets a really high bar, right? I mean, honestly, I don't think that we're all called to be martyrs. I don't think we're all called to give our lives physically over to God. But I do think that we are all called over and over again to surrender aspects of ourselves and to get things out of our way that get between us and God. And Jesus reminds us that there is light out there that we can get through that darkness. So today we heard from Psalm 51, King David. You've probably heard before, King David was kind of having his way with the world. And it was Nathan, a man of God, who called him out, challenged him because he was abusing his leadership, calling him out because he was committing adultery. He had done murder. And so David, ashamed, and with repentance, turns to God, naming his own sins, come and clean, but also hoping and praying that God would reach in and do something new with him. He wanted a fresh start. And I think we all want and deserve fresh starts. And so I'm going to ask you to do something as we close out this Lenten season. I'm going to ask you to reach into the pew and take out the red book, which is your book of common prayer. And I would like you to open it to page 646. Oh, sorry, 656. Thank you. 656. Because there at 656, you're going to find Psalm 51. And in just a moment, I am going to ask you to join me in prayer on your knees as we will pray together verses 11, 12, and 13. As you prepare to take David's words, which are so beautiful, so powerful, and such a wonderful request of our God, I'd like to invite you to consider what it is that right this moment today you would like to shed. What thing do you need to surrender into God's hands and let go of that gets in your way? It might be a way of being. You might know that you're being a certain way and you want to shift that. It might be a point of view that you have. It could be that you are unwilling in your heart and so it maybe is asking for those barriers to be taken down. It might be some deep sorrow and sadness that you're carrying. It might very well be fear and worry. Whatever it is that you can surrender to God today, I encourage you to do so. And then we will pray together and ask this God through the words of the psalmist to create a space and a place where, within us where God can write on our hearts so that when we walk out of these doors today, we walk out changed. We walk out with God within. We walk out with the confidence that we can get through Holy Week, we can get to Easter, and we can get through the trials and the tribulations of our own lives that are so hard. So we're going to take a moment of silence. So join me in kneeling, and then we will pray.
Let us pray. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Give me the joy of your saving help again, and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. Amen.